environmental protection, human rights, and basic infrastructural systems of water, energy, and finance. Now these are all shared global issues that transcend national uh, borders um, and, and also national sovereignty. In all of these cases, no state, no nation acting alone can address these issues in their entirety. Yet, as we know, time and time again, local actions within national borders can have significant network externalities that reach across the globe. The ongoing stability in the internet of the internet, and this is a message that I always give, it can't be taken for granted. Just like the stability of internet governance infrastructures cannot be taken for granted. It's always in flux. So internet architecture, internet governance, always in a, in a changing state. When you look at the ways in which internet governance scholars study internet governance and the way policymakers discuss multi-stakeholderism, uh, discuss internet governance, this term multi-stakeholderism comes up time and time again. We see it in policymaking fora, we see it in our own scholarship. I use the term all the time myself. And it's what Mark and I tried to do is take a look critically at this. We wrote a theoretical paper about multi-stakeholderism. Um, if you think about the broader internet community, they, uh, the primary goal is to preserve multi-stakeholderism. Right, that's a primary goal. And the starting point of our paper is a critique of that. So it's a critique of multi-stakeholderism as a, an end-driven, a teleological goal for internet governance. And in fact, our paper talks about four different problems with the multi-stakeholder model as currently conceived. One thing that we've noticed is that multi-stakeholderism is elevated as a value in and of itself, rather than a possible approach to meeting more salient public interest objectives, such as preserving internet interoperability, stability, human rights, openness. It's a value in and of itself. Second, we are positing that maybe multi-stakeholder governance is not appropriate in every single area of internet governance. Keeping the internet operational requires um, many, like layer upon layer, I, we don't need to tell this crowd you know, so much about this, just layer upon layer of various activities and functions of internet governance. And many of them involve private sector administrative decisions or contracts among private entities such as interconnection agreements to route packets over the internet. Maybe bringing in other stakeholders in those environments um, in the same way that they're brought in in other environments could have unintended consequences. And in contrast, there are areas where it's completely appropriate for the activity to be the function of a government or a multilateral agreement. A third critique that we provide in our paper is that the concept of multi-stakeholderism sometimes serves as a proxy for broader struggles that have nothing to do with internet governance. Uh, it's very easy to study this. Uh, for example, governments with repressive information policies, however you define that, they can advocate for top-down and formalized multi-stakeholderism in order to gain additional political power in areas that have completely traditionally been reserved for uh, global institutions or for private entities. So those kinds of approaches can result in actually, actually in multilateral rather than multi-stakeholder approaches with potentially non-governmental actors limited from participating. We see that in some fora around the world, so there's a lot of empirical precedent for that. Now, alternatively, companies with a vested interest in current governance arrangements, they can deploy the same concept of multi-stakeholderism as a tool, as a proxy. That is meant to exclude new entrants, whether public or private or it can be or, the, or me methods that are incommensurate with their corporate values or to preserve incumbent market advantage. A fourth critique that we provide is that a lot of discussion and study of multi-stakeholderism refers to discourse about internet governance rather than the actual practice of internet governance. 
and these studies are very uh, useful. I, I, there are some top-notch, you know, there's excellent research done on this, um, but it's about who can talk about internet governance rather than who can actually practice internet governance. Studies of the IGF and how it's multi-stakeholder or it isn't is uh, probably a, a good example of this. And then a fifth critique is that Internet, multi-stakeholder internet governance concern often focus, focuses specifically on the coordinating functions that are provided by ICANN. This is obviously a critical issue, really important issue, because of the requirement for centralized control over some areas of names and numbers management, and because of the public interest criticality of those issues. So that's appropriate. But the functions that ICANN performs are only one part of the broader internet governance uh, landscape that's necessary to keep the internet operational. So the phrase multi-stakeholderism, as we describe in our paper, is often employed uniformly, uncritically, and in in, in we use this term in the paper and maybe it's too strong and we'll modify it before the paper gets published, but it can become a mere shibboleth. So part of this has um, arisen from where does this all come from? I give lots of talks on internet governance, like I know you all do, and I'm in rooms a lot with policymakers who are talking about internet governance. And I think part of the problem is that internet governance can be viewed as a single thing. So I often get asked this non sequitur question, who should control the internet? Should it be the US government, ICANN, the ITU, or Google? Those kinds of questions, and I'm exaggerating a, a little bit, but that sometimes, it sometimes does break down to that. A question like that, obviously, makes no sense on its face, and it stems from a misconception that internet governance is a single monolithic system. So we set out to ask some questions in our paper. If internet governance is not a monolithic practice, what's a more useful, granular, way to disaggregate this ecosystem into the various functions. Another question, is the internet, is the multi-stakeholder discourse productive for internet governance scholarship and practice, or does it actually create some mischief? Another question, are there various types of multi-stakeholderism, and what distinguishes these types? I know we have people in this room that are, do, are doing great work on that, and I'm so happy to see that. And then how can various modalities of multi-stakeholder governance be most effectively and appropriately applied to concrete internet governance functions? I'll just throw out one question that we're um, currently working on as a, a direct follow-up to our project. What types of participation, transparency, expertise, and accountability are necessary in each of these different modalities if there are different modalities to create conditions of governance legitimacy. So our primary thesis of the paper is that multi-stakeholderism should not be viewed as a value in itself to be applied homogeneously to all internet governance functions. Rather, the more appropriate and reasonable and efficacious approach to internet governance requires determining what types of administration are appropriate and optimal for providing certain goals in various contexts whether interoperability, free expression, innovation, and operational stability in those particular functions, in those particular activities. So one thing that we did do in the paper is to present a more granular taxonomy, and I'm sure you won't be able to see this. You can see it. It's an eye test. This is your eye test. Obviously, to a crowd such as this, you know that there's no monolithic unitary system of internet governance. But one, and there are many different ways to create a taxonomy for understanding how this breaks down. I use a particular one in my new book. Um, it intersects with what other scholars have done, I, I think fairly strongly. But what Mark and I decided to do is to break it down into six different areas. Control of critical internet resources, so that everybody assumes that's part of internet governance setting internet standards by the various standard setting organizations, absolutely. Access and interconnection coordination, this is a very important part of internet governance that makes decisions about um, who can connect, who has market advantage, where censorship can occur.
worker, very important public policy issue. Of course, cybersecurity governance is one of the areas. Uh, we also include the policy role of information intermediaries, and I think that our taxonomy is completely consistent with the, uh, the, the talks that were already given here today, so there seems to be a lot of consensus about that. And then, of course, um, architecture-based intellectual property rights um, enforcement, and uh, Dr. Allison Powell will be discussing that later. So this table disaggregates internet governance into six functional areas and then further into 44 specific tasks of administrative responsibility. The table also lists the primary, although often not exclusive, institutional actor historically responsible for executing each task. Uh, so just to give one example, um, under the functional area of internet standardization, one critical task is the establishment of standards for the web, such as uh, XML, HTML, primarily carried out institutionally by the World Wide Web Consortium. So you can see a lot of uh, things that emanate from such a chart. For example, you can see that internet governance is not a monolithic system, obviously. You can also see that the internet does not just autonomously work. The coordination and administration is unwieldy. It requires uh, layer upon layer of tasks just to keep it functioning. It's not something to take for granted. Also, I would suggest that the public um, doesn't see a lot of these tasks, that it, many of these are kind of invisible to the general uh, public. And it also shows the privatization of governance. A lot of these tasks are carried out by the private sector, whether VeriSign carrying out uh, you know, uh, registry functions or network operators carrying out network management, responding to security problems, uh, social media policies, set privacy standards. So the private, pri privatized nature of this governance, along with tensions between nation-state jurisdiction and non-territorial technological modes of communication, really help under to explain well-founded concern over what counts as multi-stakeholder governance. But what I want to do now is to turn it over to my colleague, because just as it is a misnomer to speak about multi-stakeholderism, uh, uh, rather internet governance, as one issue, as one system, as a monolithic approach, it's equally a misnomer to speak of the multi-stakeholder model as a single model. So I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Mark Raymond. Okay, uh, thank you. So as Laura indicated, I'm going to talk a little bit about why we think also that the multi-stakeholder system is not one thing. And in particular, in the paper we argue that um, multi-stakeholder governance varies on at least two dimensions. Uh, it varies in terms of the types or classes of actors that participate in a particular instance of multi-stakeholder governance. And it also varies according to the nature of the authority relations between those actors. And I'd like to talk a little bit about each of those dimensions and how we break down um, and then uh, go on from there. Okay, so that chart's hopefully a little bit more readable. Um, so in terms of uh, defining multi-stakeholder governance, the, the most important thing is uh, we say that the limiting condition is there must be two classes of actors present. So if you have an instance of governance that's all firms, it's not multi-stakeholder because that's a single class or type of stakeholder. Uh, so there must be at least two classes, and there are four classes in general that we identify. Uh, the first are states, the second are IGOs, intergovernmental or sometimes international simply organizations. Uh, the third category is firms, and the fourth category we use is NGOs, and that's a, an admittedly broad category that includes uh, civil society groups, formal NGOs, social movements. That was mainly for reasons of avoiding even more complicated uh, typologies. There's a trade off between granularity and usability. Um, notably, what that shows us already is that not all current internet governance mechanisms are multi stakeholder. So, if people know one thing about internet governance, it's, it's usually that it's done according to the multi stakeholder model. Um, and we, we argue that that's a misconception. Uh, so. Uh, as an example of something that's not done in a multi-stakeholder way currently, uh, the example Laura mentioned already is interconnection coordination. That is typically a strictly private matter, or at least a, a virtually strictly private matter. The other one, uh, interestingly, that, that there is some degree of ambiguity about is the IETF. The IETF 
uh, does not have formal membership. Anyone is able to participate, and you participate technically in your capacity as an individual. So there's only one class of actor type present there. Uh, we tenuously or tentatively include it in the chart nonetheless. You can see it. The reason we do that is because in reality, people in the IETF often wear their particular hats as representatives of firms, and so that injects a degree of uh, kind of a second uh, stakeholder class sort of through the back door. So uh, at any rate, you can see along the, the left side of the chart, 11 different combinations of stakeholder types. And so that deals with the first dimension of variance, multi-stakeholder governance, which is actor type. The second dimension is the nature of authority relations. And here we identify uh, four possibilities. The first is hierarchy. Those are uh, relations of super and subordination in which some are entitled to command and others have a duty to obey. It's a very familiar political science kind of uh, definition. The second two types uh, are polyarchy draw here on the work of Robert Dahl, and polyarchy in contrast to hierarchy is a case where authority is distributed among several uh, individuals or actors, and we think that polyarchy can be instantiated in two ways. Uh, the first is homogeneously, where all uh, participants have the same formal powers. Uh, the second is heterogeneously, where they differ. So the two examples, uh, homogeneous polyarchy deals with uh, voters, so all voters have one equal vote in a democracy heterogeneous polyarchy is more akin to the separation of powers between branches of government. So legislatures, executives, and judiciary branches all have authority, but they don't have the same authority. So we can see those two types of polyarchy. The fourth type, anarchy, drops out. I'll leave that to the, the Q&A. Uh, if anyone wants to ask about that, that's controversial in IR circles. I suspect it'll be less so here. So what you can see are 33 types of multi-stakeholder governance. We want to simply make the point that this is a very variegated phenomenon, and it's not really the case that we can talk about this in any sensible way uh, as one particular thing. So up until now, we've, we've kind of been descriptive. We've told you what we think is the case with respect to how we understand internet governance and how we understand the multi-stakeholder model. The place we'd like to conclude is by talking about some of the purposes we think this typology can have for further research and also uh, about some, some normative questions we think are raised by the, the framework we've elaborated here. So the purposes of the, the typology that we present we think are threefold. First, it's useful in identifying and classifying the key features of the actual existing cases. It's useful for mapping clusters and gaps. You can see that not all the cells are filled, so this can lead us to ask questions about why we see clusters and gaps. And third, building on those first two, it enables future research on what forms of multi-stakeholder governance are most legitimate and most effective in which contexts and for which concrete internet governance tasks. For reasons of space and time, can't address that in this paper, but we think that the theoretical framework here hopefully opens space to talk about those things. And on the normative issues, the key question really is, is it okay that it works like this? Is it okay that it turns out not all internet governance is done in a multi-stakeholder manner, and further that there's a variation between types of multi-stakeholder governance. Our answer briefly to that is that at least in principle we think that's perfectly okay. We think that's unobjectionable or should be regarded as unobjectionable in principle. Different social contexts and different problems that we want to solve may require different responses. There's nothing uh, that's problematic about that. Now of course we can always want different, hopefully better governance than we have in any issue area. And that's true whether or not it's multi-stakeholder. But again, that's a separate set of questions that engages more of the future work we plan to do on mapping uh, particular governance models and types to particular governance functions. Thank you. Uh, questions from the floor? Uh, no, Robert Bello, on the, uh, I think he's the co-coordinator of the IG Civil Society Caucus, recently made a distinction between what he called open multi-stakeholderism, and he was referring to bodies like uh, the standard setting organizations and representative multi-stakeholders. Uh, the distinction in my mind is important because 
the open process, it's a single step consensus building process, and in the representative module, it's a two step consensus building process. Is this something that you will pursue in your future work? I, I caught part of that. Um, first of all, not all standard setting organizations have that openness that you described. I think that's the first thing to say, and that's part of this problem with the multi stakeholder model and the kinds of homogenous frameworks that we apply. There are um, dozens of standards setting organizations that um, institute standards for inter you know, related to the internet, and I'm not allowed in the room for some of those, and I study internet standards, and I think others here um, agree with that. So, the, so you hit the nail on the head, it's an uh, American expression though, um, that the openness, openness will be one of the criterion that will be essential uh, when we do the normative part of this. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Pupillo from Telecom Italia. Uh, I share Laura's view that uh, multi stakeholderism sometimes is uh, considered too much as a value in itself and it's not always appropriate. I, I want to suggest looking forward. Uh, my question is uh, looking at this chart, uh, I think there is something uh, missing. Um, besides uh, polyarchy, should also the model of uh, panarchy have some? Uh, legitimate role. In other words, uh, uh, because uh, intergovernance is so complex, should probably uh, try to match uh, each uh, uh, governance issue with the best institution that can, uh, that can uh, manage the governance issue. In other words, uh, uh, this idea of the equal footing you know, that is underneath the, the multi-stakeholder approach probably should be changed because uh, some component of the, of the stakeholder uh, would like to have a, 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 a major role, a leading role. What is important, I think, is that this uh, uh, role should be interchangeable. In other words, in some cases, uh, should be the state to, to lead uh, the discussion, in some other cases, civil society, in some other cases, the private sector. Probably this a different model should be considered. What do you think about that? Okay. Would it be okay if we get a few? Stakeholder organization, or 
never um, sort of saw itself as one until the end of which is that's about the time when I can that we do my they call the rest of the time. The second point I'd like to make is um, I'm just thinking about writing a paper about that and I think we also need to look at what is included by my stakeholder and what I seen over five years being on the map is that there is a, a sort of disciplinary effect. There are certain things allowed in this space and other things are not allowed. And I don't think we have thought enough about that in a systematic way. What can you legitimately uh, legitimately say and what you can't what you can't say? Sort of so not look at it only in terms of in a formal way of uh, what is adequate but also what is okay to say under this umbrella. For Q and P. Oh I I thought that was So, uh, to, the, to the first question, uh, the, the chart I think really is purely analytical. So it doesn't talk about what we should have, right? It only says, okay, here are the possible options. And um, the, the question about, you know, should we have different combinations of those for different functions is absolutely the question we want to answer next, but it's, it's not one we've gotten to yet. Um, in terms of the, the comments of Professor Hoffman, I think that I would, would echo that, you know, the, Places we can make this more critical in terms of looking at disciplinary effects of, of particular discourses in particular institutions. But again, um, you know, that's, that's great fodder for us to take on board as we extend the research. So thank you. Yes, I thought those were excellent ideas as well. In, in particular, the, the critique that multi stakeholders, multi stakeholderism confers legitimacy. It's a very important point that was made. And also the question of what is excluded. So thank you for that. And the, on the question of whether the same type of analysis would apply to a discourse as to practice, um, I would suggest that that it doesn't, because uh, and we would have to sit down and discuss that. But my gut feeling tells me no, that it's it's different because the kinds of direct public policy impacts of practice are so tangible, um, they're so measurable, as opposed to the the things that are less measurable when it comes. So I think it would be hard to make it empirical. Um, and in fact, that's why I admire the scholars who do study, uh, I think Dimitri is listening, um, you know, who study the IGF and multi stakeholderism aspects of that. But but something is very different because of the practice, you know, praxis versus just the discourse. That's an excellent question. Thank you very much for all the great comments. Next up, we have uh, Professor Yoko Nishioka from Komozawa University, and she'll be speaking Transformation from International Telecommunications Regime to Global Telecommunication Governance, a Comparative Institutional Analysis Approach. And just as an aside, we will have time at the end of the session for additional questions, so if you didn't get me in on this one, write it down so you have it for the end. My presentation is in four parts. 
Firstly, I will explain the outline of this study. Uh, through, through the 150-year telecom history, the importance of ITU's role has created, and other organizations have emerged. I wonder why this happened. I attempted to explain it from the perspective of institutions. Um, here's the actual research theme. Uh, why was the international telecommunication regime changed from monopolistic to pluralistic, informing of the overall institutional arrangement? Uh, I applied Krasnod's definition of international regime in international regional research for telecom. It's defined as a set of implicit or explicit uh, principles, norms, rules, and decision-making procedures around which actor expectations converge in the area of uh, international telecom. Uh, this is the uh, interdisciplinary research, uh, and I analyze the international telecom regime as an institution by CIA. The CIA is an abbreviation of comparative institutional analysis, of course not for central CIA is a part of new institutional economics. New institutional economics is an economic perspective to understand various institutions by interdisciplinary approach. CIA based on the bounded rationality and evolutionary game theory and regards institution as an equilibrium of the game. It focuses on institutional change and utilize historical analysis. I thought that CIA explained the transformation of the international tech regime well, and I decided to do this analysis. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, this study regards institution, international tech research as an uh, institution. It was possible because uh, both definitions of international regimes and institutions are compatible. Uh, CIA regards institutions as self-sustaining system of shared beliefs about how the game is played. Uh, as for definitions uh, international regime and CIA, both matter what's in players' minds. The form of institution doesn't matter. It can be such to be such Roles, conventions, and organizations, or others. And there's one thing I'd like you to note. Uh, this utilizes only the general institutional theory and the uh, CIA, and it doesn't uh, conduct a comparative study. This is not a comparative study. Contribution and uniqueness of this study is followed. This study analyzed whole history of telecommunication from the era of semaphore. This study explains the history as to the institutional theory, not the often used technology determination perspective. But this study was the first to introduce the concept of sub with sub and examination of institutional durability. This study explained the nature of international telecom regime and its evolution as institution. And now let's move on to the analytical framework. And this study examined the history from two viewpoints. Uh, one is uh, from one being synchronic, and the other uh, diachronic. By the synchronic viewpoint, we try to grasp what was actually going on at the different time points. By the diachronic viewpoint, we try to examine why and how the change happened. For synchronic analysis, 
uh, we have the question, uh, how is the international telecom regime is interlinked with other, in other internal and external institutions at different points in time? This question is based on institutional complementarity uh, suggested by CIA. CIA points out that institutions are interlinked with each other. For changing, they need to co evolve. Then, uh, this study introduced the concept of sub regimes to understand internal institutions, which together make up the international telecom regime. This table explains the three sub regimes. There are uh, interconnections, the resource allocation, and network collection. Uh, each sub regime includes element regimes as well. The interconnection sub regime developed in the issue area around network interconnection. Each element regime are uh, technical standardization and accounting. The resource allocation subregime is economic as well. It allows scarce resources and includes element regimes for radio waves, IP addresses, and so on. The inequality correction subregime balances divisions among players and includes uh, the technical system element regime. Three, these three subregimes correspond to the ITU division, as uh, you can see. This study illustrates the overall institutional arrangement at the end of each historical phase, um, which was a uh, broad eye view of how internal and external institutions were linked to each other. This is an example of uh, the illustration. In the chronic analysis, uh, we need to answer these questions. They are, uh, when were sub regimes formed and changed? Where the past dependence is identified? How, uh, how did institutional durability work? How did institutional crisis, crisis occur? The last three questions correspond to three interesting insights on institutional change provided by CIA. First, CIA points out past dependence, and we see that the initial conditions and incidental historical events decide the direction of institutional change. Second, CIA explains the vulnerability of institutions and suggests that once institutions form, they tend to endure because uh, institutions are equilibrium of the game and tend to stay. Third, uh, state institutional crisis. How may you may wonder when institutional change happens? Uh, that's when gaps between expectations and actual institutional institutional results bring institutional crisis, which often accompany with sudden mutations. Now let's move on to actual analysis and discussion. This slide is a summary of the historical analysis. This study identified five historical phases. <laughs> Mainly corresponding to organizational changes involving the ITU and its predecessors. So there, uh, five phases are uh, first growth, stability, stagnation, and regeneration, which is a life cycle. Uh, the, this uh, slide also shows the internal institutions which are published in the middle of the slide. Uh, these bars indicate at which point it's a regime formed in the history. 
at, at the bottom, uh, there are external institutions outside the international telecom regime. Now, uh, let's look at the history in more detail. As you know, uh, the first international organization for telecom is the International Telegraph the first phase is the proceeding period of international telegraph and as you know, the first telecommunication technology is telegraph. So you may or may not know the semaphore is the predecessor of telegraph. Semaphore is this. It has apps to make a messages. For military purposes, the continental European government expanded semaphore networks to the national border. Later, Telegraph replaced Semaphore and took over the way of operation. Among those states, two regional uh, telegraph unions formed in 1850s for interconnecting their networks. Of course, UK and US led the development of Telegraph. However, since they are away from other countries that was ocean, they had to wait for submarine cables for international connection. Uh, this is uh, the overall institutional arrangement then. There's not yet international regime, uh, but you can see the origin of interconnection sub-regime. Then uh, the growth period started the establishment of international telegraph by combining the existing regional telegraph in 1865 in Paris. Later, International Telegraph Union absorbed International Radio Te Telegraph Conference and became International Telecommunication Union. International Telegraph Union set the framework to widen the scape, scope of interconnectivity to an international scale beyond continental Europe. At this point, International Telecom Regime started. Founders are 20 of European states, mainly from previous regional unions, and the UK and the US didn't join at the beginning. Uh, therefore, I do reflect the logic of the previous regional union along the future path dependent. For example, primary uh, membership of ITU was limited to the state. After almost 50 years, uh, International Telegra Radio Telegraph was formed in 1908 as wireless telegraph became regarded as necessity of safe navigation in the sea. These two unions merged into International Telecommunication Union in 1932. Here you can see International Telecom Regime and Interconnection Subject established. The stability phase started as after the World War II through the 1970s, and during this time, IT increased its authority and stability. In 1948, the IT underwent a significant organizational reform to be more efficient and more proper as an international organization. Moreover, it became a specialized agency of the UN forming the IFRB, International Frequency Restoration Board, for problematic, problematic frequency allocation. At this day, institutional arrangement became International technical regime is contained inside of international cooperation regime. And you can see resource allocation sub regime is added. At that time, ITU accepted the UN invitation rather passively and set its purpose of international cooperation. Then IT started to change its nature. Previously, IT didn't have a particular purpose or aim and it was described as a part of a developed country. The 
period from the 1980s to the IT's major organizational reform uh, in, 90, in 1992 was the stagnation phase. Many newly established nations joined the ITU after World War II. Then various gaps among the member countries became notable. The led to, this led to forming the third cup regime, that of inequality question. In addition, the tackle market was increasing competitive and started to go fast to technological innovation. In other words, Telecom businesses were seriously waiting for technology standardization, but the institution actually unable to keep up the need. The gap between player needs and what the institution provides became wide. This led to institutional crisis and development of organizations such as uh, private standardization and private standardizing organizations in like ITU. Then the ITU was forced to undergo another large uh, organizational reform. Uh, here you can see an uh, inequality coverage in Ali. ITU cooperated with other organizations in the end, and some part of the connection coverage was located outside, uh, outside ITU in the private. The period following in 1992 reform of the ITU until the present is the three generational phase. Three generational phase. This doesn't mean three generation of ITU, but rather a three generation of the overall international telecom regime. External pressure on ITU has strengthened. The WTO established in 1994 strived for deregulation of existing basic telecommunication services. The internet has undergone the process of the company with formation of the ISOC in 1992 and ICANN in 1998. Regarding internet governance, there are the third uh, world thing as the ITU supported by developing the nation and ICANN supported by developing nation. At this stage, internet governance has structured outside ITU. And you can see uh, as already described, each of uh, institutions, the three sub regimes came about histori historically different times, likely due to network expansion and development. The first sub regime was the interconnectivity, indeed. Increasing interconnected nations was important in the birth and growth period. The resource allocation sub regime dealing with frequency. Added. Then the telecom regime was stable up by becoming a specialized agency in the stable phase. The inequation uh, sub regime was added uh, when many developing nations joined the ITU after World War II, and after World War II, and the gaps between members became notable in the sub nation phase. Okay, similar development can be observed in the internet governance. IETF for interconnection started in 1986 and ICANN for resource allocation was established in 1994. Uh, the variability of subreaching differ according to differences in institutional switching costs, necessity for past dependent Making. And if the given subregime is interconnected with other institutions, the interconnectivity subregime is based on ad hoc activities among interested participants. Despite the resource allocation subregime is based uh, to continued participation of virtually all entitled members, the inequality question subregime in turn is strengthened through its association as an institutional way. The international cooperation regime centered on the UN. Uh, that the three subregimes have different levels of durability is strongly tied to the pluralistic tendency of regionality in the international, international telecom regime. Pluralistic 
Final paper for this session is by Professor Allison Powell, uh, who is at the LSC, and she'll be speaking on there you go, assessing the influence of online activism on internet policymaking, SOPA, and ACTA.
can the person who uploaded my presentation join? <laughs> help, please help me. Oh, he left. Do you know where it was loaded onto that computer? I don't know if I need to switch it. I do have it on the thumb drive. Derek, do you, do you know where my presentation has gone? Uh, no, it's not in there. Great. Um, I'm, it's really my great pleasure to be here um, at uh, the IGF and it's the, for the first time at GigaNet. Um, I've been following remotely for many years, so it's a real privilege to be here. Um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, actually is, was very nicely introduced um, by um, Laura and her colleague, um, because I'm going to talk about what doesn't fit into um, some of the ways that we currently think about multi-stakeholder governance. And to be clear, I am, I'm, I'm not a study, a, a scholar of institutions. I'm a scholar of um, activists and media processes. And so that's the perspective that I'm going to take in this interdisciplinary space. And I think it's an unusual perspective, but I think it's a perspective that um, we should um, consider going forward, especially considering how activism and how the mediation of activism has come to influence the way that we talk about and, in fact, the way that we make decisions about um, the Internet. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go from the perspective that I, I think, actually, that there's a crisis in, like, like Laura, I think there's a crisis in, in multi-stakeholderism. Um, and I think the crisis is that it has come to um, signify what, something that it is actually not. And it has come to represent the process that we are participating in here in, in this kind of space. Um, but it hasn't come to represent the different kinds of processes that people are participating in in lots of other spaces and times. And it, has, and it doesn't really, um, as far as I can tell as yet, um, have come to represent um, the ways that people actually think about the internet as meaningful to them. So my contention is that once people start talking about the various social and political aspects of communicating over the internet, many people who had not previously considered that they were interested in internet governance actually became very interested in some of the main principles of internet governance. And I'm going to explore in this study how that happened, and I'm going to unabashedly explore it from a symbolic and discursive point of view. Um, with the argument that that symbolic and discursive point of view in these two cases, the activism around SOPA and the activism around ACTA, actually did come to influence um, the ways that decisions were made um, on a non-symbolic um, and non-discursive level. So um, I'm going to start with two moments um, in 2012, and um, many of you will be familiar with at least one of these moments. The first moment is January 2012, um, in which if you, in, uh, during which time, if you were in the United States, you may have seen um, something like the left-hand image. Imagine a world without free knowledge. Um, and this is a sort of um, blackout of Wikipedia. And perhaps if you were in Europe, you might have also seen something like the right-hand image, um, which is, this is taken from a street protest in, um, in, a, in a small city in Estonia, um, which is it's a Wikimedia Commons um, photograph. I didn't take it. Um, and I, I do put those together. In sort of deliberate way of, of illustrating the way that the internet itself is used to communicate um, about inter internet activism, which is part of my argument. You may have seen something like the right-hand image, and the right-hand image is an image of um, people on the street protesting about ACTA, which was a treaty um, that many perceived would be damaging to the principles of an open and free internet. So these are two images of popular protest uh, in support of normative values such as a free and open internet. 
And I argue that these are images from a kind of multi-stakeholder future horizon. And I'm going to explore in, in a fair amount of detail um, actually how these images are related to the campaigns that they were part of, how they're related to each, each other, and how they're related to um, the different kinds of decisions that were made about SOPA, which is the Stop Online Piracy Act, which is a, um, a piece of legislation in the US Congress, and ACTA, which is, a, as I mentioned earlier, a, an international treaty um, that was interested in protecting intellectual property, um, but which was, like SOPA, opposed by many activists who considered that it would have negative impacts on what they considered to be some of the um, normative values around the internet. So I am going to investigate the extent to which online activism plus representation through traditional media um, come to be significant for, for policy change. And this paper uh, takes two case studies and compares them, and it compares the case study of um, networked activism in opposition to SOPA and networked activism in opposition to ACTA. And I look at um, a number of different elements within this uh, assessment. I look at the existing networked collaboration structures. This is actually how people um, connect together, which is a kind of organizational level um, of, of activism, which, as I um, alluded to earlier, actually, to a certain extent, depends on some of the resources that the activism um, uh, discusses itself, thus putting it in the category of what um, Milton Mueller calls access to knowledge movements. These are movements that um, have norm that make normative claims and also often use the um, very structures to which those normative claims refer to uh, to um, in the in the service of their activism. Uh, there's other very interesting dynamics um, within these two different types of activist structures. There's a leverage of, of online activism and um, and what's been called slacktivism or clicktivism, a sort of passive activism, which uh, which again depends on the current function of of, uh, of the internet, which permits people to um, sort of connect themselves to a cause without actually having to do very much other than clicking a button. Uh, it also um, tends to take advantage of certain aspects of protocolary power as opposed to institutional power, uh, because that um, online activism and slacktivism can also be directed into things like distributed denial of service attacks, which are very trivial for individuals to participate in, but because of the nature of, of protocolary power, uh, can concentrate those energies into disrupting some function of the internet, such as um, shutting down not shutting down, but preventing access to, uh, to a specific website for a specific period of time. Um, so these are things that are, that are quite um, practical. These are um, organizational aspects, and there are also discursive aspects. And the combination, this is again a sort of science and technology studies perspective on this, the, the combination of the ability of the internet to permit certain modes of organizing with the way that normative claims about the internet structure are reflected in actions that use those structures, combined with the ability to um, leverage things like protocolary power, have discursive impacts, such as the ability to position the internet as an exceptional space, something that is exceptionally interesting, exceptionally valuable, um, or exceptionally under threat. And these, in turn, influence traditional media representation, both of the internet and of online action. And one of the things that we can observe um, across these two case studies in, um, in, uh, in the paper is that the media representations of the internet were focused by these online activists, by this online activism. So in fact, um, act activism that took place online and was of such a, a unique and exceptional character allowed the mass media to write about the internet in a way that it had not been able to write about the internet before, gave it them, in media studies terms, new frames for understanding the value of the internet. And that, in turn, allowed all of these normative values to become reflected and discussed in the popular press. And if you agree that the popular press, in fact, still is one of the ways that, um, that public opinion is formed, and many of my media studies colleagues would argue it is still significant, this is quite um, this is quite important in terms of changing um, the opinion, the public opinion, and changing the way that that, uh, that legislative decisions are made. So these media representations of online activism contribute to the positioning of the internet as an as an exceptional space. 
that is either fragile or incredibly generative of something very valuable. Um, finally, there's the, the sort of final um, representation of the internet in the popular press is of a menacing cyber world, and this is the kind of um, the sort of dark side of this fragile but very important internet space is that the popular press, in at the same time as it as it uh, represents the internet as something that is fragile and must be protected, in uh, in its discussions of activist as activist actions taking place online, it also manages to frame the internet as a kind of menacing place. Um, and in fact, manages to position, as we'll discuss later, um, the activist actions themselves as a um, as kind of menace. Um, so what did I actually do for the study? And I'm, I'm going to go straight into the methods and, and discuss my findings. If you're interested in more of the theoretical background, the way I've connected this to access to knowledge movements, the way I've connected it to broader debates about internet governance, I'd really like to take that up in questions, but I, I would first like to tell you what I found. Um, so I, uh, I, did t I sort of took a three-pronged approach um, to these two different cases. Uh, first, I analyzed the forms of, activi of activism to take, to take account of that organizational level, um, that kind of organizing on the internet about the internet that I was discussing. Um, Luckily, uh, Yochai Benkler and his team had just done a fantastic link analysis of all of the ways that online media covered the SOPA story uh, in the U.S. press, and I was able to um, draw on their paper quite substantially, and I've just begun to do a secondary analysis of their data um, to uh, fill in the gaps. Um, I also uh, surveyed um, the other different types of activism, include not just including internet blackouts, but other kinds of symbolic actions that took place um, between late December 2011 and early February 2012. Um, then I did a discourse analysis of mass media coverage of both the SOPA and the ACTA um, actions. Um, my dates on this slide are wrong, unfortunately. The anti-SOPA um, time frame that I analyzed was from December 2011 until February 2012, which took into account this, um, this supposed internet blackout, which. Uh, the mass media um, reported as having broken the internet. Um, and then I repeated this analysis um, with uh, the um, material published in English that discussed anti-ACTA protests. Uh, and finally, I followed up with interviews, uh, particularly of people who were involved in the anti-ACTA campaigns in Europe um, as a way of filling in the gaps because there were not as many um, observable forms of internet activism. Um, so, the first part of my findings um, are about the anti-SOPA action, and um, I found some very interesting things in terms of the organization of these protests um, that are significant as well for our discussions of governance. Uh, we tend to talk in internet governance circles about um, sort of long-term strategy, uh, and we tend to talk about um, co sort of dynamic coalitions and these kinds of movements of institutional actors. Um, and I found largely for this kind of online action that it's tactics over strategy. Um, and it was not about the, the, how people were thinking about strategically putting forward their, their, uh, their points of view. It was about a number of established non-governmental organizations um, working together to try and do something that was going to have a very um, abrupt and interesting short-term impact to tactically draw attention to their access to knowledge. To, to, to to issues relevant to access to knowledge movements. Um, and the second thing that I found, which is familiar to many people who study um, uh, activism in um, these information-rich contexts, is that they're strange bedfellows. So the people who are working together are not just um, NGOs, traditional mandate-based NGOs, but they're also technology companies, they're also individuals, a number of emergent internet companies, and um, what I call, call multitudinous activist organizations, such as Anonymous, who are not really organized, who are not really part of a movement, but who participate in these kind of tactical eruptions of um, attention to specific uh, policy issues. Um, in terms of the representation over the time period, especially around the internet blackout, uh, there is a real shift in the mass media coverage from a kind of discussion of business as usual um, to a discussion of a uh, more comprehensive um, and interesting discussion of internet rights and freedom. And I'm going to just, um, I'm working with old media here, I'm going to rifle through my paper and read you the quotations that I have highlighted. So 
as an example of the way that this shifts, um, in the in the in the early 2012, we have a quotation like the following one, reading, "It's a pitched battle between Hollywood and Silicon Valley," says lawyer Scott Elbernick, a partner at Fox Fox Rothschild LLP in Philadelphia. On the one hand, you've got music companies and movie companies, and on the other, the big internet sites. So up until the, the uh, this internet blackout, there was this perception in the mass media that this was just something that you could categorize very clearly as opposition between two different ways of thinking about intellectual property and sort of two enormous entities. Um, and then things actually started to shift quite a bit. Um, and they shifted in the media in terms of the representation of different kinds of actors, but also different kinds of tactics and strategies. Um, for example, um, another quotation from um, a representative media source at the time, um, very early 2012, the anti-piracy bills presented a difficult test to a young, disorganized, and largely politically inactive technology industry. It is unclear that Facebook and Google, left to themselves, could have swayed members of Congress or the White House without using the internet to marshal opposition. So that's one perspective that's much more institutionally biased, but at the same time you find um, media coverage that's coming out that's representing um, a sort of broad swath of internet people as significant disruptors in this um, previously sort of business as usual fight. Um, the blackout also reveals, a sort of, as I said earlier, a, a kind of dialectic, fragile versus um, exceptional internet. And finally, there's a very interesting mimetic propagation of symbols of censorship. And this is where I say that the discursive in influences the practical. Because in fact, in the SOPA um, protest, it was not that the internet was broken. Quite clearly, anybody who wished to use various internet resources could find ways to do so. It was the, the idea that the internet could be so easily broken that allowed this um, kind of discourse of um, protecting a fragile resource to, um, to emerge. So this is my table that, um, that just represents the range of entities who were involved in this protest. And I, I would be very interested to see how this speaks um, to the table presented earlier about various different forms of internet governance, I think we could um, make some interesting, um, create some interesting conversation when we think about um, various different entities I've listed here, no, almost none of whom are um, traditional mandate-based public advocacy organizations who you might consider to be civil society, um, and many of whom are very other, are other different kinds of entities, um, including emergent advocacy and activists organizations who, uh, who use online organizing to constitute their membership, um, all the way down through technology companies such as Google and Facebook, online media and technology media, and finally, multitudinous activists. Um, and so these are the various types of protests that occurred between December 2011 and February 2012 in the United States. So here is an example of what I was calling symbolic propagation of the discourse of censorship. This is um, a screenshot from Flickr. Uh, which um, symbolically blacked out Flickr users' photographs um, on January 18th as part of this wider blackout of the internet. And this is why I'm saying that this was not something that actually had to do um, much with a disruption of the internet in terms of internet resources, but more with a symbolic circulation of a kind of a perception that, that the internet was fragile and it was at risk of being censored and dismantled, unless these particular legislative propositions were defeated. So you can see there's this um, uh, evocation of censorship and darkening. Um, they have an, this one, I liked this example because it explicitly says it's a symbolic gesture. It suggests methods for future activism, of, um, which, uh, of which brings in this um, clicktivism and slacktivism that I was talking about. And um, it, uh, it provides some information about the legislative decisions being made. And many of these other, uh, of, of other similar um, kinds of symbolic blackouts also suggested a call to action, which resulted in a record number of contacts of elected representatives. So the second part of the, of the, um, of the research uh, uh, considered um, activism around um, the opposition to the ACTA Treaty. Um, and the organization in this case uh, was of a smaller and much less extensive network of activists. So in, in the sense of it being a, a, a network activist um, project, it was much less networked. These are, this is a much smaller group of 
people, and there's a much less diverse range of stakeholders. Uh, it, however, it did the activism against ACTA also included traditional and emergent political parties. The Pirate Party was well known for having participated in organizing um, anti-ACTA rallies. Uh, and there was a much more visible role, at least in terms of media representation, of anonymous and other multitudinous activist structures. So anonymous was very important as a kind of the images around anonymous, the anonymous face mask, um, the, uh, the, um, the, the headless um, suited person, that, which is also an icon of anonymous, were much more prevalent in media coverage of um, anti-actor protests in Europe. Um, and although um, anonymous was not directly involved in any of the sort of organized January 18th SOPA strikes, there were a number of videos circulated by anonymous and a number of um, distributed denial of service takedowns from um, anonymous that were uh, associated specifically with the days of action around ACTA. In terms of the press representation, there's much more of a positioning of the activism around ACTA in terms of the existing frames for activism, what's um, known in media studies as the, the existing political opportunity structure. And this is existing or emergent political parties organizing rallies. The rallies are being covered by the press. There are pictures of people in the street. It is very clear that it is the number of people in the street that is important rather than any particular um, unusual action on their part. The internet itself is positioned as ambivalent or threatening. Um, and the protesters are young and digital digital, and digital is a, is, a, is a gloss for easily misled by bad information in this case. Um, and I'm running out of time, so I won't read you any more quotations, but there are some nice quotations from the, from the European press about how these young people have been told all kinds of wrong things about this treaty, and they are being misled by being online, and they're going out and protesting in the street, and this is all a little bit, um, you know, they're just being naive. So the, in this case, the internet is, is, um, is sort of positioned discursively as a, as a space of naivete. Um, and one final anecdote of, um, in terms of the ways that the internet is positioned um, as threatening in the European context is that a number of the activists that interviewed talked about how when, they are, when the um, members of the European Parliament um, were contacted by record numbers of their constituents, some of the people within the European Parliament apparently considered this a form of soft terrorism or cyber attack because the European members of Parliament had received so many emails. So this is a really interesting position, positioning, um, which is quite um, different than the one that we see in SOPA. Um, as an example of the ways, that, however, that this much smaller network of activists did use the internet. This is a, um, a screenshot of um, Marit Kishatka's, um Reddit post, which is a call to action. Um, uh, people who are opposed to ACTA. Um, what's interesting here is that she alludes specifically to SOPA and PIPA activism as a way of framing what people need to do in Europe. Um, and there is some indication that the ACTA, anti-ACTA activism would not have been as successful in preventing the European Parliament from ratifying the treaty there had not been preceding activism on a very similar access to knowledge issue. Um, that's quite contentious, but there is some indication, at least in the press, they are initially they are linked before the press go off and say it's all about the children in the streets. Um, and finally, here's um, my final evocation of the importance of these kinds of symbols of, um, of uh, opposition, and this is the Pol Polish members of parliament with, um, with paper um, Guy Fox masks within the European parliament. So, we know that nascent multi-stakeholder actions take seemingly important uh, emergent forms and Alice, aspects. Alison, I think yes. we should leave the slide for, okay, for we'll leave the it. audience. All we'll right, you can questions. read it. <laughs> thank you, Alison. All right, thank you. So do we have any questions for Alison on her presentation? Mike Nelson with Microsoft. Um, one of the things that we're concerned about right now is that the framing of the future of the internet by the press and by politicians is just getting more and more negative. Um, I was in the Clinton White House 20 years ago and we wrote this document, the National Information Infrastructure Agenda for Action. And you go back and read that, and there are two things that are striking. One, we got a whole lot of things right, but two, it's just almost utopian. And, and that really was the frame that we had at that point. The internet was going to change everything. It was all going to be better. Do you have any places we can go to, to perhaps 
get a more positive frame for the future of the internet? Is there, as you look at the current discussion of, of what's coming, is there anybody who's actually trying to give the other side of the story like we did 20 years ago? And this is something I'm working on right now, so I'd, I'd very much like to talk to you. John, uh, Allison, thank you very much for a riveting uh, paper, and, and we'd like to hear more, which is uh, great. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if you have any sense, a bit of a, uh, an exogenous a variable or a way to think about this, but the uh, popular representation of groups like Anonymous and the campaigns against uh, ACTA and so forth in the popular, uh, not the press, but the popular culture. Uh, a number of television programs that are framing the, the, the role of Anonymous and so forth. I just wonder if you thought about that at all or considered it. Thank you both very much for very interesting questions. Um, how can we find a positive frame? Depends what you mean by a positive frame, because um, I, previous to this study, I did a study of how net neutrality was framed, and I also compared um, sort of transatlantic representations of net neutrality. And in the net neutrality debate early on, we very clearly get the utopian internet space as the, as the sort of first frame. And I think that's a problem. Um, I think it's a problem because where do you go from a claim for a utopian um, democratic world that's unconnected to the governing institutions of the world, right? It only really worked for about 20 years, and then you realize that, that um, you know, complex systems need to be governed. There are a number of different uh, competing interests. And so this is actually, I think, um, we can't get back to utopianism. I don't think that that's, the, that's really the, the direction that, that, um, that is going to be valuable, beca partly because the way that the utopian internet was framed was that it was not of this earth. And do you remember John Perry Barlow? Perry, Perry Barlow says, you know, we are governments of flesh and steel. No, you have no, no, no. There's, there's, this is yeah. the contrary. Know, there's Barlowism, and then there's what it is, the White House, which has just explained all the great benefits that were coming. <laughs> and and what I, what the headline that summarizes this is what in the, was in the Washington Post about a week and a half ago. And, it, and the headline was, Why is it cool to hate the Internet? And it was reviewing uh, Gifgany Morozov's book. I just, I, somehow right, it's exactly, this but because this is exactly his space too, right? Why does he get all these, all his books published? Because they're all like, no, the utopian thing was wrong, right? It just gives the, uh, it gives you an opportunity to have an oppositional polemic, and I don't think that having one polemic versus another polemic is really going to give us any kind of good future. So to get to your point, to what you were really asking is, where do we actually look for good future imaginings of the internet? Okay. At this point, we're going to open. I'm oh, about sorry. to answer the question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> and and it's really easy. Universal human rights. Let's start there. You know, this is something that we have already worked out, and we're already debating in international fora. Why don't you? Why don't we try and see whether we can actually apply some of the normative, high-level normative principles back, so that we don't just have polemic A versus polemic B. It's whatever. We can discuss later. Um, all right, at this point, we will open the floor to questions for the whole panel. So if you would save some questions for earlier panelists or have continuing questions for Alison. Thank you. Um, two comments about Alison's paper. Um, first, what I really liked is that you um, um, also include in your analysis the way the internet was framed. What I, I looked at how academics wrote about ACTA, PIPA, SOTA, and one of the things I noticed is that many people treat the internet as a mere tool for online campaigns, whereas what I find really important is the way the internet is framed. And I thought particularly in these, in these campaigns it was about what Jonathan Citrain calls the generative internet. It's a specific internet that is defended in these campaigns, and not just any internet. And the second point, what I noticed in the discourse about ACTA, PIPA, SOPA is how the whole constellation of actors suddenly has changed. So far, particularly in the literature about copyright enforcement, users seem always to be the victim. Passive actors, right, who just are rule takers and are treated badly. 
and suddenly the uh, copyright literature changes things, and the users are become the active players, and that is quite interesting and rarely noticed. Thank you. Other questions? Um, is there someone in the room representing the book launch that's supposed to be sitting here? Yeah, come on up. Who is yours? Uh, you're right here, right now on the schedule. No, because no one will show back up for the book launch. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of this moment of silence to just say that um, if there is anybody who is not going to be participating in the really excellent um, APC summit on um, cybersecurity this afternoon, um, I'm also part of the network of in, on internet science, and I'm going to talk about methods for understanding multi-stakeholder governance this afternoon in a workshop that we're holding over in the Ulu Watcher room, so that's just in case you are not going to be able to fit into the super overpacked APC um, Giganet summit. And I would also say I'm no longer part of the uh, GigaNet leadership, but whomever, I think we have our leaders here, we would like to make sure we are capturing, this is a wonderful turnout, and so we would like to make sure we're capturing everyone that's here. I don't know if we have a, a sign-up list or something, John, because the list, I mean, this has been a fantastic standing room only crowd where we had to bring in extra chairs, and I think we'd like to make sure we capture that in some way. So you GigaNet leaders, you know, uh, please, please capture them in some way. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't anyone who's not currently a member of GigaNet and interested in joining, why don't you um, give your name and email either to John or to me? Is Francesca in the room? Or to Francesca? We'll make we'll have three people gathering names, but it is really wonderful to see um, many familiar faces and uh, great turnout. Perfect. Um, thank you all for being here and staying here during the lunch time. Uh, I'm very pleased to see so many familiar faces around the room. For the launch of our uh, book entitled uh, The Evolution of Global Internet Governance, Principles and Policies in the Making. Uh, fortunately, I only have one very fresh copy of this uh, book on me, but uh, you're free to go copy it uh, after the presentation. Uh, I'm afraid to pass it around because it's still unpacked, so that's the problem with it. But, um, so hopefully you all got the flyers and uh, I'll say a couple of words more about uh, how you can order the book if you're interested in, uh, in reading it. Uh, my two co-authors, Jamari Shenu from the University of Lausanne and Rolf Weber from the University of Zurich, are unfortunately not pleasant, uh, present here in Bali for this occasion. Um, the uh, launch is done here at Giganet because uh, it is the outcome of an excellent um, collaboration that we had. Uh, which was born in the framework of a regional GigaNet workshop we organized in uh, Geneva in May this year. Uh, we built on the controversies of the uh, World Conference in Traffic and Communications Wicked in Dubai in December 2012, and also on the policy discussion at the World Telecom Policy Forum 
uh, to organize this uh, two-day expert workshop, bringing together internet governance stakeholders to reflect on the current governance practices, uh, challenges, and scenarios for the future of the internet. We had an impressive group of people in the room participating um, from all different categories of uh, stakeholder groups, uh, including uh, many Veganet uh, members, such as Milton Mueller, uh, Marion, who's here today, um, Volkan, and Oscar, all the way around, uh, Bill Drake, and uh, we also brought in um, a couple of uh, early stage uh, researchers who ended up uh, working together with us uh, for the book. Uh, so as to complement uh, the experts who are giving their policy opinions on this. The book is inspired by an array of perspectives presented at uh, this workshop and draws on table presentations and roundtable discussions held in Geneva at the Reddit Institute. Uh, throughout this collaborative uh, process, we benefited from the constant support of Milton Mueller, Chair of Ganet, and uh, Thomas Wierstecker, the Director of the Program for the Study of International Governance at the Reddit Institute in Geneva. So special thanks to them for making this possible and also to all of the participants in the workshop uh, for the richness of the debate that we had, which helped us conceptualize the book. The volume explores the consequences of recent events in the field of internet governance policy um, and possible ways forward following the 2012 uh, weekly meeting. It offers expert views on transformations in governance more broadly, on the future of multi-stakeholderism, and on, on the increasing importance of uh, cyber security issues and collaborative processes in this realm. Uh, if the wicked uh, 2012 represented a moment of crisis, as many would have uh, described it, uh, revealing underlying tensions in internet uh, governance that can be taken back to 15 years ago. Uh, this volume is seizing upon this moment of change and offers a reflection on emerging norms and principles such as internet freedom or online protection of human rights and their role in mediating institutional contestation and reforming the um, current governance structures. Uh, internet governance scholarship has spent a lot of time focusing on institutions and frameworks uh, and reproducing abstract dichotomies like bottom-up versus top-down, public versus private, uh, state versus market, etc. Such dichotomies reflect the often uh, antagonistic nature of IG debate, and I'm sure we're going to see a lot of this in the in the coming days here at the IGF. However, as illustrated by the examples discussed uh, in our book, uh, the frontiers between the categories are blurry and unstable. Critics of intergovernmentalism often actively participate in the work of the OECD and rely on WIPO to um, uh, ensure the protection of uh, intellectual property rights. Autocratic regimes call for democratic uh, participation at the global level while curtailing democratic participation at the domestic level. Uh, private companies advocate for government-free internet while cooperating with the US NSA in surveillance programs. With this book, we aim to move beyond these dichotomies and to analyze the existing and emerging principles and processes of cooperation, placing an emphasis on um, a set of issues that uh, need to be addressed by future development. Um, the chapters of the volume have uh, shown how the evolution of the internet has been marked by debates which, beyond the regulation of the internet itself, affect the international system more broadly. We have considered internet governance in the making from three complementary angles. In part one, we looked at the institutional dynamics explaining the emergence and the evolution of uh, internet policy making at the global level, as well as principles that shape its transformation. And here we have chapters by Professor David Silvan at the Graduate Institute in Geneva by Michelle Rieu, uh, together with her co-authors Nicholas Adam and Bill Company at the Center for um, Research and Integration and uh, Globalization at the University of Montreal, and Anne-Claire Jamat from uh, Cornell University. Uh, in the second part of the book, we examined multi-stakeholderism as a dominant mode of governance um, and pointed to its shortcomings and potential ways Reform it. The contributors for this part are Richard Hill uh, from Hill and Associates, uh, Rolf Weber from the University of Zurich, and uh, Avi Doria, who is uh, luckily here with us today and will be able to give us a glimpse of her chapter in, in a bit. Um, and for the, for the third part of the book, uh, we explored the example of internet security as a case study 
of the competing logics of national interest and uh, global cooperation. Uh, each of the chapters in the book uh, explores ways forward. We have asked all the authors to think about uh, uh, the challenges that dispose it uh, to further processes um, in order to make global internet governance more democratic. Um, they all insist on legitimacy, participation, accountability, and uh, cooperation as basic feature features of uh, future processes. Uh, these conclusions are very important at a time when internet governance is probably entering the new phase of change, and I'm sure we will hear more about this um, at the IGF, but also um, next year there are so many um, uh, major events planned ahead that will probably shape uh, the post treated environment in completely different ways. Um, the policy recommendations that are explored in each chapter of this book will probably become essential elements of this coming debate. Um, and in that sense, the book serves as a reminder that the role of uh, Wiki 12 in the future of the internet governance uh, more broadly has not been fully unpacked for the moment. The volume addresses not only researchers interested in the evolution of uh, new forms uh, of transnational network governance, but also practitioners who wish to get a scholarly reflection on uh, current regulatory development. And uh, we really hope you'll find, you find it useful. The book is um, for the moment uh, available for being ordered in Switzerland, but by the end of uh, next week it's, it's going to be available on the uh, Springer um, global website, so that can be easily ordered and hopefully for a uh, reasonable amount of time. And I'm going to give the floor now to Abby, who's here, and speak about the chapter. It was actually interesting when I was asked to, to do a chapter in this book because I had sort of just been a sort of stray that, that walked into this, this particular um, uh, meeting I hadn't planned on and hadn't been part of the groups preparing it. And um, didn't have a presentation at all, but as usual, shot off my mouth. Um, so it was very nice of them saying, well, okay, that sounds like it might be interesting. So what I actually was looking at, and what was interesting is the chapter for me became a very strange journey. Because when I started writing it, I had an antipathy and a discomfort with the term multi multi stakeholderism. And I was among the many who basically look at that term and go, eh, I, I'm not quite so sure that that term is one we should be using. By the time I finished writing the chapter, I found that it was a term I very much adopted and and sort of felt very comfortable with. So so I appreciated the opportunity. Uh, in, in looking at the, the term, I, I started out, first of all, my, my educational background was, was philosophy, not any of the political sciences. So I actually started out being a philosopher and trying to look at the term multi-stakeholderism and basically trying to do a certain amount of linguistic analysis on the term to see what we could be possibly talking about and what meanings we might be picking up by using such a term and what was the implication of calling something an ism. And, and, and explore that a little. Um, went a little further then and started looking at the models that we were using, the various multi-stakeholder models that were, that were there, looking at the notion of stakeholder and, and looking at some of the perhaps aberrant nature of stakeholder that we've gotten into. With the Tunis agenda, we've done very well in, in, in defining a participation of stakeholders, but we have a very static definition that was deemed the proper stakeholders by government with none of the other stakeholders having participated in defining their own nature. And so started exploring sort of, well, what would it mean to be a stakeholder? What, how, how do stakeholders organize, self-organize, et cetera? So, so that was an area I started uh, exploring and, and went a little ways down that path in, in the chapter. That sort of led me to the, to the next part I was looking at is one of the things that we most often hear is that multi-stakeholderism, multi-stakeholder models, multi-stakeholder governance is the enemy of democracy. And you hear that very often in, in conversations, sort of, you know, if you're a multi-stakeholder, that means you no longer support democracy. Uh, and, and, you know, in looking at that, sort of, started to look at what do we mean by democracy and 
find out that most of the people need representational democracy and have sort of forgotten the sort of real aspirations of a more participatory democracy of a, you know, not all the way perhaps to a direct democracy, but something along that path. So started to look at the notion of the multi-stakeholder model as something that basically tries to sort of the, the find a point somewhere between the, the, the notion of representative democracy, which we actually never see in internet governance because we really have a second order derivative of representational democracy where we elect someone that that someone appoints someone and that person that is appointed actually is the one that picks the people that are doing internet governance. So we don't even have representational democracy working there. We have what, I don't think I called it in the chapter, but I've started calling it since then, derivatives of the notion, you know, a second, a first or actually second derivative of, of the notion of representational democracy. So, so basically explored that notion too in terms of multi-stakeholder model as a way of trying to implement notions of participatory democracy. And, and, and seeing if, if that particular notion works, and if that does, where can we go with it? It's a short chapter, so it only goes so far in, in exploring any of these things, but that was essentially what I was trying to sort of open up the dialogue on, that when we're talking about multi-stakeholderism, looking at it as something that is both theory, advocacy, and action, and as when you look at what is an ism, and um, the, the notion of stakeholders as self-defining and the structures of stakeholders as self-defining at various levels. Don't go so far as to call it fractal, but I've started to think of it as very much as that kind of notion, but that's hand wavy. And, and then basically looking at participatory democracy and how we can try and develop that through multi stakeholder models. So I have one quick question, sort of for Aubrey, and it, it relates to Laura and our colleague's uh, presentation earlier. Uh, Aubrey, I can't wait to read the chapter. It, it sounds extremely exciting. For me, one of the key issues that's missing as we talk about multi-stakeholder participation are the means by which both uh, civil society um, uh, organizes, engages, uh, the kind of financial resources to, to facilitate a multi-stakeholder model. A lot of that gets dropped out and is uh, is, is problematized in how we have civil society participate. So even in this particular meeting where you know the changes were at the last minute, are we going to have it or not? Well, governments have their resources to be able to participate. The private sector has you know kind of resources that private sector has to participate. For civil society members trying to make a decision at the last minute, can you participate or not, is more challenging. And I think we have to think about the institutional and financial mechanisms that enable or uh, impede civil society's participation in this broader model. Uh, if I can quickly address, first of all, I actually did not get specifically into, because what I was trying to say is the fact that we have these three is that actually the right breakdown and, and such and those. But just as a point on, on this particular IGF, we have twice as many civil society participants as any other group. So while I take your argument quite seriously in terms of you know, being civil society and always looking around for who's willing to pay my ticket this time, um, you know, and, and, and whose sandwich board am I gonna have to wear when I, when I go to the meeting, um, we actually do have more civil society people practice, or more that call themselves civil society that self-identify when you've only given three labels that you can pick. More people have picked that label than any other label. So, I, I mean, I totally agree with you, and yet the numbers sort of present a slightly different, but I didn't get at all into the notions of how do we fund. I was more looking at defining, and as one of the things that you hear now, especially in the working group on enhanced cooperation discussions, is roles and responsibilities, and they have been defined, and it was the, the scholars of the WIGIG that defined them, and I go some way to debunk that having been there and, and drawing on some of the previous that, you know, those were all set in an earlier time in Geneva, and then just sort of have 
percolated all the way through, got blessed at some point as having been accepted by us all, and yet never once have we actually sat down and said, what are the appropriate stakeholder groups, and how are these defined, and what are their actual roles and responsibilities? and such. So, and again, it's a short chapter, so I only open up that door. I don't actually go very far down in it. Hopefully, in some of the other stuff I'm writing, I will get further down in it, but haven't done so yet. Any other quick questions or comments related to the book? If not, I think we can... All right. Thank you for, very much for coming in and launching your book here at the Gignet Symposium at this year's IGF. All right. Thank you, everyone, for a great morning session. We will be back at 12. Yeah, it's a little odd. I'm oh, sorry, at 1.50, where uh, we'll have another paper, and then that precedes this afternoon's open forum sessions between 3 and 6. I just want to, on cybersecurity, cyber surveillance, cyber warfare, I want to emphasize to everyone that we are trying something different this year with that, with those forums. That we are going to try to run this as a under Chatham House rules, for so the audience will not be attributed. The people up on the panel will be attributed, but the people in the audience will not. Um, to make it a more open forum, so that people can freely ask questions to the experts we have uh, here. So um, be back this afternoon. Enjoy lunch. Thank you. <laughs>